All right, and we are live. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we'll give folks a little time um, to stream in here before we get started. But while we do that, um, I do like to um, make note of a couple items. Um, the first is that the session will be recorded. Um, and then we can share that recording with everybody afterwards. The second is that we will be doing polling questions throughout. Um, we have about seven or eight polling questions. And so we will take a pause, kind of send those out to the audience and we will share results in real time. Um, from our experience, this can be a pretty engaging way to uh, time the conversation and maybe as part of follow up afterwards. And then the third piece I'd like to point out here is that we do have a Q&A box in the bottom. Um, I think most people are familiar with the Zoom uh, interface here, but you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, from my experience, it can always be a little more interesting conversation uh, to ask some questions. And so we, we do strongly encourage uh, you to ask away as we're going through this. And again, we can try and answer those and build them into uh, part of that conversation. And so with that, um, I would like to kick it off here for the webinar. And um, perhaps we will start with some introductions and I'll hand it off to our panelists here, starting with Mark. All right, hello everybody, I'm Mark Rosenthal. I am the Chief Revenue Officer at HQO. Uh, we partner with landlords to help transform the tenant experience across their portfolios. And we're really helping landlords solve three core issues. The first one is that attraction of tenant companies and, and, and the attraction of employees for those tenant companies. Most companies, as I think everybody probably knows, spend 90% of their OPEX on, uh, on their people wages, salaries, benefits. And so we're trying to help landlords solve that 90% problem for their customers, the, the tenants. The second is fragmentation. There are over 8,000 prop tech companies out there and it's really hard to navigate and manage that whole landscape. And so we're trying to bring that all together into a cohesive platform. And then third is differentiation and the ability for landlords to have an experience that really differentiates them from the asset across the, across the street or next door to attract that, uh, to attract those tenants and maintain those those leases and and those rents, and we're solving that with our uh, with our operating system for commercial office buildings HQOS, which has three core components: the tenant application, the mobile application for tenants, which is like a universal remote for buildings, the marketplace where landlords can shop and uh, and purchase uh, solutions like OpenPath, which uh, which Dave will talk about. And our digital grid, which is the intersection of data between the suite stack, the system stack, and the services stack at a building. So it's a little bit about HQO, and I'll pass it to Dave. Hey, good morning to my uh, West Coast colleagues, and good afternoon to all of you east of the Rockies. I'm Dave McInnes, head of business development at OpenPath. Um, if you're not familiar with OpenPath, we're a physical access control provider really best known, I'd say, for our hands-free mobile access that we've delivered to the masses. Um, and we do that through an open cloud-based uh, platform. We go to market through certified partners, and today those partners serve uh, the U.S., Canada, and as of this quarter, we've now uh, activated uh, across at the Atlantic. So, uh, Kevin, I want to thank you and the uh, Crowd Comfort team for really putting this together. I'm excited to be a part of today's conversation. Great. Thanks, Dave. And finally, uh, Eric. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Graham. I'm Kevin's co-founder and uh, CEO of Crowd Comfort. And uh, we are um, in the business of managing employee requests. Basically, we serve Fortune 500 companies. Um, we thought when we started the company that there was a real need and opportunity to leverage native mobile capability in the workplace. And what we do today is we um, we geolocate and auto route the request of an employee from where they are, whether they're in a conference room or a kitchen or at the front door, um, directly to the people that might respond to various different requests. And in big corporations, this is a real challenge. Uh, there's no easy way for people to submit a request in the workplace today. And basically, we're looking to be the operating system that solves for this broad set of challenges that employees face around their safety, productivity, and comfort. Um, and even more in a COVID world around the sanitation, understanding 
what's happening, what's been cleaned, where and when, those kinds of things. Great. Thank you for everybody. Um, and then thanks again for everybody who's joined uh, us today so far. I realized I didn't even do my introduction. I am uh, Kevin. I'm Eric's co-founder, as he mentioned. I also feel like I'm a full-time webinar moderator these days. Um, I'm getting pretty familiar with this Zoom uh, interface here. So uh, to kick it off, what I'm what I'd like to do here is I, I mentioned poll questions earlier. I'm going to launch our first poll here and um, kind of let people answer that. So take a look. We have two questions there. Um, I think I ask these almost every webinar, but it always just helps to get a sense of where everybody's coming from in terms of this reentry and what they kind of see uh, in the future in terms of occupancy. While you're answering those questions, a um, little bit about the webinar today. I think, you know, a lot of folks are webinared out. There's a lot of content out there. So when we put this one together, what I consider to be probably the last one for a few weeks, weeks with the break coming up with 4th of July, our goal is really to provide some, some new, fresh, and interesting content. And the way that we brainstormed a way to do that is by leveraging lessons learned from people who are already starting to come back. And as I mentioned, you know, combined, we have 3,000 customers across the world. That's a lot of data points. So my hope is that we can provide some new, fresh, and compelling content for the folks um, that are joining us today. So I'm just going to end this poll and share the results. It looks like uh, you know 68% are still in the planning phase. And the second question, it looks like by the winner here, by 2021, about 35% of you are saying 25 to 50% of the workforce will have returned. That's interesting. It's more, it looks like Combined 19.3, that's about 50% are saying that by 2021, you'll have 50% occupancy or less, um, which kind of aligns with what I've been hearing. But to kick it off, I'd love to hear from the panelists here, maybe touch upon this data, but also would be great to maybe start off to lay a foundation, your major one takeaway about the pandemic from the time it kind of emerged to where we are today. And I'll start with Mark. Sure. Um, I think the big takeaway is a lack of preparedness in general. We talked to a lot of landlords who were um, helping their customers and they themselves trying to figure out how to set up VPNs and how to get laptop or excuse me, desktop computers home for their employees so that they could enable remote work. And as, as someone who's worked in tech for a long time, it was amazing to me because I'm set up or our companies have always been set up for work from anywhere. Um, and it was just astounding to see how ill prepared a lot of companies in the market were to enable that flexible environment. And now the needs that, uh, that come on the backside of COVID become much more prominent as these changes have been made. How do you make the workplace compelling and, uh, and engaging, and most importantly, how do you make it safe, right? So, um, you know, we're thinking about things like IoT and, um, you know, QR codes and touchless, uh, contactless environments, which I know Dave is, um, uh, is, is going to talk about as well. Great. Dave, thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with Mark. Um, I mean, certainly the, the initial 30, 45, 60 days uh, as, as we started to shelter in place, the scramble for a lot of companies was, how do I make my employees productive? And how do I, um, how do I enable them to feel like they're still part of something, part of a team, rather than just isolated in their homes and trying to figure out, you know, how, do I, how do I manage work and my life balances? Because I got the kids home, you know, my spouse is home, uh, and, and it's a juggling act. Um, I think now really what the, the focus shifted then into um, how do you make tenants feel comfortable and confident to come back to the workplace, right? And that's, that's emotional, that's psychological, that's physical. Um, and, and so, you know, we've seen you know, great progress and, and those, the, the progress has been through a series of what I would call tactical or physical low tech implementations first, right? So if you think of, you know, if you're going to make a workspace, uh, amenable and, and comforting to, to the workforce, whether it's your attendant, it's your employees, or it's a building and it's your tenants, it's, it starts with, you know, you got to assess what are my options? 
what makes the greatest impact with the, with the least amount of effort to start really that low hanging fruit. And so we've seen that, right? You see the signage, signage of now I know where I'm supposed to go to get in and the path that I'm supposed to get when I leave, right? So ingress and egress, you see reminders about social distancing. You see decals on the floor that actually tell you where to stand, whether it's you know, in the queue for the elevator or actually in the elevator cab itself. Uh, and then, you know, of course, the other uh, important aspect is janitorial, right? Cleaning. So communicating and, and, and increasing the frequency of cleaning cycles, as well as the level of sanitation that people are applying. So those are sort of the things that we observe and that we hear about. The exciting part is technology, the low tech stuff is starting to turn into more interesting technology investment for the remainder of this year and then beyond. Love to hear, Eric, kind of what you're seeing, especially because you, you guys focus on really large tenants primarily. Yeah, so, you know, our focus being uh, Fortune 500, I, I would say many of the, the heads of corporate real estate that we engage with have really been, you know, just, I would say in April, it was all like trying to adjust to the, how do we enable a workforce at home? And then it, it and then in May, it sort of moved into okay, how do we get people back in a way that they feel confident, safe, comfortable? And um, yeah, I think the thread between the, the three companies that are here, we're all leading with native mobile technology. And I think our world is transformed overnight because of this. And, you know, the example I have, I was out to dinner, you know, the restaurants just opened up in Massachusetts and you go, out, you go out to the restaurant now and on every table there's a QR code and you scan that code to get your menu to create a touchless interaction. And that, that to me just demonstrates how much of a change we're all going through. Um, the same opportunities exist in the workplace, but I think as, as both Mark and David said, corporations and, and, and real estate managers, portfolios and landlords have all been really resistant to technology and to change. And so this is really kind of opened the door to say, wait a minute, we need to rethink everything. We need to change the way we, we do things. And I think, I think a big area, is, I think especially for um, HQO and Crowd Comfort is that employee communication piece, being able to deliver information effectively in ways that's easy for them to digest and understand what, where they can get resources and also communicate back. And that's, you know, we're, we're about the, the big about the communication back piece and the feedback and the understanding where people need things and, and getting them resolved quickly. Awesome, great. Uh, love the points across the board there. I think we're off to an interesting start. So I'm gonna launch another poll while I kind of talk about the way we're formatting the rest of the conversation here. Um, so once again, two questions, um, take your time to answer and I'll share them afterwards. Um, while we're getting that data, the way we structured this today, and I know it was in the emails, but it's really about the three phases uh, of the re-entry or, or return to work, right? And so the way we, we see this manifesting itself is the first phase is that first 90 days, which we were just touching upon. Phase two kind of is the next uh, 90 to 180 days, which would take us through the end of the year. And then phase three is kind of what does this all look like? Um, one year from now. And so that's kind of the, the way we're going to approach this. And I think we already started touching upon, um, let me end the poll and kind of share the results with folks here. We started touching upon what phase one is all about, which is really uh, rethinking things, taking a step back, and kind of a discovery phase of, of what's to come. But when you do talk to some of these companies, I would ask each of the panelists that you're working with, you know, in this initial 90 days of phase one, kind of getting in the weeds a little bit, what are the things that you see working and what's not maybe, right, as part of this phase one? And I don't know if we can work this particular question in, but someone in the audience did ask, you know, what do you recommend for deep cleaning office, which I think is representative of this discovery phase, right? So I think people are still trying to figure out, but once again, working with the customers, what are you seeing um, be successful out there today? And so Dave, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Yeah, so um, let me approach this really from the access control side because that's that's sort of uh, you know the open path wheelhouse. Um, I'd say the the early low tech approach, but leveraging uh, access control technologies would be things like you know all of a sudden we have to adjust 
who has access, right? And the schedules by which they have access to offices as they either during that shelter in place and only essential workers can arrive uh, and be present and or during this early return to work cycle. So the ability to adjust on the fly or based upon, you know, programmatically door schedules and group schedules, right? So that, that becomes important. Simple features like first in, last out, so that all doors to, let's say, to a tenant suite become unlocked with that first person arrival, or that last person out knows that, hey, I hit this button and now I've secured the suite, right? I don't have to worry about, oh, geez, you know, is it, is, can a stranger walk in? Um, things about notification of activity, right? So if a certain individual who shouldn't be there on premise and actually goes in, how does management get a notification to say, hey, Dave, you know, you're not supposed to be there on, uh, on Tuesdays. So simple things like that. I think the next phase that we're seeing today is, is it ties into access control, but it's, it's gonna be around, again, raising confidence in, with, uh, with tenants and employees, self-attestations, right? So simple surveys that I take each time I'm going into the workplace, right? And I have to answer those questions and it can be as few as three, four, five questions. And based upon the results of those questions, my, my responses, that puts me on a risk matrix. Right, and that, mis that risk matrix score determines whether I should be dynamically have access privileges into the space or whether there's a, you know, don't come into the office. And even if you do, you're not gonna be able to get in, right? Because, because you're high risk. The same is true with temperature screening, right? So we've seen all kinds of interest in thermal cameras and do they work, do they not work? Are they effective on uh, asymptomatic uh, patients or uh, COVID sufferers? It doesn't matter you have to make that investment to make the overall population feel comfortable. But those results should have the same thing. They trigger whether you have permission to go in or you don't have permission to go in. So things like that. We also see occupancy threshold management, right? So now we know that the local, the state and uh, governments are determining and mandating occupancy levels for space. How do you as an employer, how do you as a landlord enforce that? Well, you need to invest in technologies that can actually keep track of how many people have come in and then based upon those thresholds either continue to permit access to people or stop access and then provide notification through apps native apps through digital display so those are the types of things that we're seeing that are becoming really effective and i guess the last thing would be obviously touchless access right so the ability to have a phone in a pocket wave your hand that door unlocks and then when it's in tandem with an automatic door operator uh, that that door swings open. So now I can get into secured spaces without touching a thing, which is from an emotional standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, totally top of mind. And then even from a physical, because that's one less thing that we all have to touch. Yeah, um, I, I was struck by the poll that it came out exactly 50-50 on whether people were comfortable going back to work. That, I mean, I, I, I wish we had set up like 10 more questions to follow that one, but we probably can't do that right now. But I think it's, it's sort of, it's very uh, interesting. And, and, you know, a question that, that, that keeps coming up over and over around what is the purpose and meaning of the workplace? And I'd love to ask a follow-up question like, you know, what would make you comfortable? Or are you, if you're uncomfortable, are you thinking of never going back or, or, or those kinds of questions. Um, well, Eric, but, you're in luck. We do have some more questions on the way coming up about the awesome. next phase, which might just touch upon those things. Awesome, perfect. <laughs> what a setup. Mark, thoughts? <laughs> yeah, we're, um, uh, to dovetail off of what you said, Kevin, you know, the, what we found uh, similar, to, similar to Dave is that that first sort of 30, 45 days was really challenging and really uh, quiet as people were trying to figure figure things out. Um, but then very quickly from there, we moved into this period of discovery, identifying what the technology providers that were out there were, what solutions they could provide, how they could make the workplace feel safe or be safe for, um, for employees, and really starting to look forward to repopulating the offices and, and bringing people back. Um, there is, uh, so when we get into that phase, what we heard from a lot of landlords is, oh my God, there's so much tech out there. There are so many companies. How do we figure out who to use, what to use? There's all these overlaps. This company says they do this. This company says they do the same thing. 
Um, what's the difference, right? Um, so we've so we've tried to sort of accelerate that uh, that solution on our roadmap with the with the marketplace. But um, the other thing that we're that we're hearing a lot as landlords are thinking about how they bring people back to work is the need and importance of a communication tool, right? And like we're saying to landlords, it doesn't matter. Like collect the email address of everybody in your building. It doesn't, it doesn't matter or use a solution like HQO or any of the other ones that are, that are out there. But when you bring people back to work, you need to have real time direct communication to people in your building, because that's how you, uh, that's how you make them feel safe. That's how you mitigate risk. Right. So when you have the cleaning crew that doesn't show up the night before and you need to change the ingress and egress procedures for the day, or you need to shut the building down, sending that email to the tenant rep and hoping they forward it doesn't really uh, doesn't really work as a solution anymore in this in this environment. Right. So um, uh, so communicate. So we've had a lot of landlords coming to us and asking us about solving the, uh, you know, solving the communication problem for them. Got it. Great. No, this is, uh, this is interesting stuff. And you're, you've got my wheels turning too as the moderator. So I'm kind of already starting to think about phase two, right? We just kind of talked a little about phase one, what we're seeing. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch another poll here. And um, these are questions kind of that we can address in phase two. So I'm going to launch this and let folks answer it. And then I'm going to kind of um, segue into phase two here. So I agree with Eric. I think it's really interesting that it's 50-50. And I, I think that is what we're seeing as well. And so what we seem to be seeing is that the next phase, phase two, which is the next 180 days that takes us to the end of the year, is really, in a lot of cases, voluntary. If you are comfortable going back to work, you can go back to work. Uh, in addition, we did another survey last week and found that 70% of organizations have allocated new budgets to COVID-related items. And so my question to the panelists here is, you know, are they spending that money in phase two? And then what if they are, what does that look like? Like, what are they making those investments in? And then the final question is why? Why those particular things? And um, once again, we'd kind of love to just hear the thoughts from the panelists here. I will end the poll and share it with folks. Um, leave it up there for a little bit. But Eric, maybe we can kind of start with you and your thoughts on phase two and where the investments are, what's really going to happen then? Well, I, f I feel like you know, some of our, our clients have just started reopening, uh, but on a limited scale. Um, St. Cobain, for instance, just opened um, with allowing 50 people in their workplace into a, into a building that, that hosts 800. So they're really dipping their toe into it. Um, and I think that that's consistent across the board. Um, I think, you know, one of the, the big questions is this question of, is it, you know, voluntary versus mandatory? And I, I'm not sure we're ever gonna get back to fully mandatory work. It, it may take some time. Um, I think the, um, in this near term, this phase two, I think, is sort of a uncertain period in terms of the companies that are starting to bring people back, I don't think are that confident about, they're not, they're not talking about bringing 100% back. And so I think we're in this sort of uncertain period. I think a lot of companies have, have been certain to say, we're not going to do it until September, or we're not going to do it until the end of the year. Um, and so I think this phase two is, uh, is going to be a little bit, um, you know, of a, of a across the board um, variation. Got it. Dave, any thoughts on that? Yeah, the, um, you know, so we, we track um, on our website, we actually posted a social uh, distancing index. And so we, we look at activity levels across a couple of thousand open path deployments in the U.S., and it's the, the range of businesses is pretty broad. Everything from schools, which you would imagine don't have any activity right now, right? Um, houses of worship, um, you know, retail, office, uh, multifamily. And what we're finding is that, uh, you know, you hear it in the news, you, you see it uh, on your streets, that 
that people are um, very interested and they're prioritizing restarting the economy over their own personal health concerns, right? People want to get back to work and they want to help stimulate the economy again. Um, and we see that in the data. So this, this week we're showing that we're at uh, 40, 46% activity level pre versus pre-COVID numbers, right? And that's up three percentage points from last week or three points from last week. Uh, and within four weeks ago, it was only at 35%. So as states reopen, you're starting to see more activity. But to Eric's point, that's 46%, right? That's not, that's not over 50%. That's not 75%. So there's still, I think, a great deal of uh, trepidation of returning to work. And, and employers are being very supportive of that as they figure out sort of how are we going to make our workspaces configured to, to uh, support social distancing guidelines or expectations. Um, and we're also finding, I think, that business can continue and can be productive, um, you know, while people are working remotely. You miss that collaboration. That was one of the things that, you know, the collegiality and the collaboration score really high on the poll results. And honestly, that's what that's what I miss. You know, the Zoom happy hours are great, but, uh, you know, there's only so much money I'm going to keep spending and feeding to the liquor store down the street. The, these the Zoom happy hours are killing me. So I, I need to go to work just for that. Um, but it's, uh, you know, for us, we're a prop tech company like you guys are. It's, it's like business as usual now. I mean, we're just, we're just flying. Uh, but that's, you know, that's kind of a long-winded uh, response there. But we're seeing, you know, we're seeing tentative uh, return to work, certainly. Dave, you can treat those Zoom happy hours like my parents used to tell me in high school to, uh, to treat the parties, you know, just get, a, just get a solo cup and fill it up with seltzer and, you know, nurse it for the entire happy hour. That'll save the, the liquor yeah. store. Yeah. There you I go. Also, I also was um, uh, was going to comment on the, the poll results. I mean, the, the four, the top four responses that I jotted down were engagement, collaboration, community, and amenities. A um, uh, little self-serving because that's the wheelhouse that we work in, but they were the results from the poll. So worth, um, worth talking about. I, I do think that while we've, while we've done a good job as a, as a society and as a workforce of shifting to remote work, that collaboration and community is, is something that people miss. And we've seen a huge amount of engagement as we've rolled out a lot of sort of remote work type of programming through, uh, through the HBO mobile app. We've done things like, um, uh, like a show us your space contest where people can send in pictures of their home office. This was in the in the very beginning of COVID. More recently, we did a program with, um, uh, with EQ Office and Blackstone at the Willis Tower called Catalog Cares, which was really about reigniting retail, which has been totally decimated here, right? It was a, it was a gift card purchase program where you could buy gift cards to the catalog retailers and Blackstone matched the, uh, matched the purchases with meals to frontline healthcare workers, right? Um, all executed through the, uh, through the My Willis, uh, the My Willis Tower app, um, which, uh, which HBO built for them. So there's a lot of that, um, that, that craving for connection, for collaboration and for community that we can, uh, that we can establish. And we're now thinking a lot about um, not just the workplace experience and amenities, but we're thinking about the full sort of driveway to driveway experience um, uh, to steal from our, uh, our, our friend, Frank Sapovitz, who's, um, who's partnering with us at, at HQO and uh, used to work for the NFL and designed the Super Bowl experience. He talks a lot about this like driveway to driveway experience and how you get people from their home to their destination and back again. And that's the entire uh, that's the entire experience, not just the uh, not just the eight hours, nine hours, ten hours that they're in their actual office. And and, and it's interesting, and that that's a that's a great point. Um, but I think about like there's along that experience from driveway to driveway, you're entering different parts of your life and your building throughout the day, right? And so, you know, this drives to one of my questions, which is, you know, what what's happening to the tenant landlord relationship right now? Like, what does that dynamic look like in phase two? As people are coming back like who's who's taking ownership of of making these changes and i'll also tie this to one of the questions we got in you know what's next for the post covid 19 office like whether it's on the landlord side or on the tenant side what are you doing to kind of up your game um and provide that better experience or what are you seeing being done out there yeah Kevin, that question was almost uh, the same question janice just asked i i'm alluding to yeah 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 that's great um 
I think, you know, I, I, I think that uh, along the lines of, of Janice's original question, you know, deep cleaning, you know, I think what we could recommend is Crowd Comfort is offering heat mapping sanitation. I would say le leverage mobile technology to be able to better visualize this invisible task of what, what's been cleaned and when. Um, I think that's a big opportunity. Um, you know, I, I think the, you know, the other point that, that was brought up um, by Jay McIntyre, you know, is the whole commute from, from home to, to the office. And I think that's a big question mark for me. I think the, the downtown city tower is, you know, is going to be challenged because you've got a, a problem with the elevators and how do you get that many people into a building that's so tall um, as well as the public transit. And then you're also, you know, the outdoor space piece is another uh, big question for me. Um, I think that, that w what's going to happen is there'll be more of an emphasis of suburban campus type of office space um, that's going to be in, in demand more yeah. and more. Yeah, we had a we had a client call this morning, Eric, and they talked about they talked about elevators, public transportation, and childcare as the three big factors, right? Like, I can't come I can't go back to work with no daycare and no schools and no camps and no options for my kids. Um, when I do go back to work, I'm terrified about public transportation and being in this little tube with um, you know with people who could be uh, you know sick, either symptomatic or asymptomatic, right? Um, and then when I get to my office building, I have to get into another little tiny box with other people to make my way up to my suite. But once I'm in my office suite, I'm all good. I feel, I, we're hearing that from our own employees. We're hearing that from landlords. The other thing we're hearing from landlords is to, Kevin, back to your question about sort of that, that interplay or that relationship between the landlord and the, uh, and the tenant company. You know, historically, the, relate, the, the relationship has been landlords own sort of the base building and then the tenant and then their relationship really ends at the door to the tenant suite, right? And the tenant does everything else. Now there's this, like, how does the landlord help the, the tenant inside of their tenant suite as well and create a better experience and better technology and solve those, solve those problems? So we're hearing a lot of, of that from our landlords as well. Like we're thinking about how we can be better partners to our, um, be better partners to our tenants. Yeah, it's uh, I think the, the it's a collaborative partnership, right? So that it's 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 becoming we both have a seat at the table. I'm a tenant with my landlord, um, and so there's policies that we agree upon, right? And and so some of that is just behavioral, right? So for instance, the, you know we all have a common goal of a congestion-free lobby today, right? I don't want to be with a hundred people in a lobby just waiting to get onto an elevator or waiting to get through a a, a turnstile. So you know an agreement around load in and load out, right? an agreement on uh, shift times, right? So you see different schedules for different companies where I might have the 7.30 to 8 a.m. arrival and then another company has 8 to 8.30, right? So you start to cluster people amongst familiar work groups. So you've minimized the sort of exposure. Um, certainly signage becomes important, right? In terms of, you know, that social spacing, the social distancing, uh, agreement on elevator loads, right? I've seen between four to six people is kind of the standard, depending upon the dimensions of each cab and with a dot on the floor. You've seen low tech approaches. So we, one of our webinars we had, we were showing uh, in China that basically there was a cup. I'll just say it was taped to the wall in each cab with a bunch of toothpicks in it. You grab a toothpick and you hit your button. RxR has done something really clever where they've, they've created these, they've produced these uh, firm cards that they hand out to every tenant. And that's what you use to press a button because they don't have time to respond and say, hey, let's make our elevators touchless. That's something you can do in conjunction with some relay wiring and with your access control system. Uh, and then further down the, the road, we see more interest, greater investment in more advanced elevator technologies like destination dispatch, right? Where now it's, there is no button to press in the elevator. It's all a kiosk and that kiosk can be enabled through my credential that's on my mobile phone and it knows my home floor is on floor five. So it calls a cab for cloak for uh, floor five when I arrive and it says, go to, go to cab B and I'm whisked away and I stand on my dot and I'm done touch free. So those are the types of things. And I think also then on the visitors, right? That'd be the last policy is there's an agreement around visitor hours, 
right? So visitors shouldn't be commingled with office workers as they're coming in. You sort of agree that visitor arrival should be 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. That's it. Outside of that, let's do our best not to have early morning meetings on site or late in the day meetings on site with visitors because now you commingled folks. No, that, great points. And uh, I think those are spot on. Those are some great approaches and, and interesting solutions um, for this unique challenge that we're in. You know, I, I ask about the, the, the tenant landlord dynamic because um, when you think about that, depending upon how people handle, there's a couple different outcomes, right? And from what I'm hearing from you and other conversations with folks is there's some landlords who are a little hands off right now, kind of just seeing what happens. And there's others who are being very proactive. Uh, I think we've seen the same thing, Eric, on the tenant side, which is, uh, again, I think tenants maybe are a little more hands-on because they have that, that viability they need to be, but there are still some that are being a little hands-off right now saying, I'm just going to wait and see, you know, how this all pans out, what the data tells me before we start doing things. And so the two outcomes are either you have the tenant and the landlord being proactive, which is like the optimal scenario. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have both the tenant and the landlord being really hands-off, which is probably worst case scenario. Um, and I, I imagine most will fall somewhere in between, but my question to you would be like, what are the risks uh, of being hands off at this time and, and maybe preparing, doing your discovery, but not taking action during this kind of phase two? I mean, I, th I think it's really complex because it, as a corporation, especially the kinds of corporations we serve that, that have, you know, millions and millions of square feet. You know, they're occupying so many different landlords' buildings in so many different ways. And they have the, all their internal systems that are meant to serve all these different functional, you know, purposes within, a build, within that corporation. And so it becomes very hard for the landlord to mandate a system for the employee that's going to cover everything. So really what you're trying to do is figure out how do you, how do you get the information to the landlord in a way that delivers information to them quickly that they can respond to, but, but also delivers value to them in the data and the data exchange that they can have. Um, and all, all for the purpose of delivering better service to that building occupant, who in one part is the employee of that tenant company, but they're an occupant of the common areas and the, and the, off, and the, and the, the gym and the, and the cafeteria downstairs. So it's a very interesting, complex problem. Yeah, you're, you're touching on exactly what we just talked about, right, Eric, which is that partnership that's required now yeah. between the landlord and the, and the tenant company. Um, we, you know, we've had, a, we've had a, a, a number of conversations with, um, uh, with Goodwin Proctor, who's our, uh, who's our counsel, to talk about what are, like, what are the risks and opportunities for, for landlords here? Like, what if they, what if they take that hands-off approach and do nothing? Um, and then there's a, and then there's a, a cluster of case of COVID cases in their building when people come back to work. Um, you know, that, that presents exposure and risk for, um, for landlords. And they sort of talked about two things. One is how do you keep people safe when, how do you actually work to keep people safe when they return to the, to the office? What's the technology? That's a lot of what we're talking about here. And then the other is how do you mitigate your own risk so that you don't, uh, so that you don't wind up in, uh, in litigation. And one of the things they talked about back to, back to this notion of communication is by leveraging, by leveraging that direct communication with end users in the building, by showing them things like, like what Eric has talked about with cleaning schedules and uh, sanitation station locations and enabling touchless access and other touchless features in the building, you significantly uh, de-risk yourselves from, uh, from, from litigation. So even if you have that cluster of cases that, that pops up, you know, well, we have a we have a, a screening questionnaire that employees have to fill out before they're able to come to the building, and if they uh, and if they are symptomatic or if they answer the questions and they don't pass the screening, their mobile access is uh, is is disabled for the day. An alert goes out to other users in the building that there's a COVID case. There's um, you know the cleaning schedules are are ramped up, and we post those in the application, so on and so forth. Right yeah. um, now, you're significantly de-risking your um, your position. Well, you you mentioned something earlier about the interoperability mm -hmm. of all the systems. I mean, ultimately, that's where we have to get to. And this is again why there, there, it, this requires investment. Right? No one's just gonna you know crowd cover is gonna 
design interoperability in some system that we haven't even sold to yet, you know, to, to their, to the customer that use it. Um, so we have to figure out where that investment comes from. That's typically has to come from the corporation who is the tenant, who is the employer. Um, and, and I think it speaks to the reasons why crowd comfort and HQO need to need to do more work together so that we can bridge that gap. And as well with, with open path, um, and figuring out the ways in which we build that interoperability um, so that it is easy for, for employees. I mean, the two questions that just came up, one, um, one was you know, about air quality, and the, then the other one is about uh, reassuring employees, visitors, the physical location is safe and secure, right? These are, cons people are concerned, and the concern is like all encompassing. I mean, you, you think about it, it's like, the air is a concern. The surfaces are a concern. And the others that might, including myself, are also a concern. Um, so it's kind of all encompassing. And how do you, I, I mean, I think technology can bring a lot of, of assurances and the ability to communicate more effectively. Uh, and I think that's, uh, it's a big opportunity, but it, 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 you know, we're in the early phases of getting these things to talk to each other. You know, you mentioned you mentioned two two words, Eric, that I think are worth uh, uh, highlighting, uh, or you actually one from you and one from Dave. Dave talked about cloud enabled, right? Um, and you talked about interoperability. There are a lot of systems out there on the market still that are that are neither of those things. And as we think about how to bring technology together and unify the experience and unify the data and streamline information flow and communications, like if if you're not if you're not interoperable and you're not cloud enabled, then you are way behind and making it really hard for whether it's a tenant company or a landlord um, to, uh, you know, to, to engage and provide that experience and that safety that, um, that they need to provide. And you, you know, this topic of there's so, there's so many of these antiquated systems that are really embedded in these, mm -hmm. in these companies and the way they work. And but they 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 become a huge barrier to this interoperability because they're either it, you either can't get to the current standard or it's so expensive to get there that it's just cost prohibitive, and and uh, it's, yeah, it's really uh, it's a big challenge because it's you know people have you know, companies have invested so much time and money into these systems yeah. that they don't want to change. So the, so the themes I'm yeah, picking up on, Dave, I'll hand it off to you for last comments on phase two here, are transparency, collaboration, interoperability. Dave, final thoughts on those before we kind of transition to phase three here. Yeah, I was going to, uh, I was going to actually hit on one of the questions that came up around uh, a COVID positive employee, right, that re-enters re the workplace and what do you do? Um, but it was, it's really just kind of echoing and, and amplifying what, what Mark and Eric just said about, uh, it's about interoperability, right? And that's really the, that's really the, uh, critical value um, component of property technologies, cloud-based systems, right? Where it's, we're all using open standards-based connect, connections APIs. Uh, and so you can do things very quickly, right? That are very impactful. So in terms of the, when you have someone who's identified, been identified as I'm positive, right? Now, how do I, number one, ensure that person goes into quarantine? Number two, how do you identify who that person may have come into contact with, right? So an easy starting point for access control is, who else was in that space at the same time over the last two weeks, right? So now you have the list of these are all the people that should get screened, or maybe they just have to go into self-isolation quarantine for those two weeks. We have a partner called Cognition that has a smart building platform. And so they use multiple technologies, including OpenPath for exactly this contact tracing solution. So using OpenPath plus video plus facial recognition, they're able to provide that contact tracing. So you basically roll, you know, it's almost like you're just rewinding the tape and you say, okay, who did this person come into contact with? And then each, each person, check them, check them, check them. Okay, this is the pool of people that have potentially been infected. And then who did they come in contact with, right? So it's, it's not like a one-to-one, -one, it's like the spider web effect. But that's the type of thing that, uh, you know, the type of impact that modern property technologies can can make on a positive basis. Yeah. No, I, I think that's key. And, and it's amazing to me still doing these webinars where when you start to focus on just even one of these issues, how complex 
just tackling one of them can be, which again, I think emphasizes the key um, to collaboration, right? This is why it's gonna be a collaborative effort. Yep. And I think it's key to why we're doing the phases, right? Why we're doing this phased approach and not just jumping right back in. Um, so I, I think there is a long road ahead. Um, I do wanna, we're, we're kind of at 15 minutes left here. We are getting some great questions. Continue to ask those. I would encourage the audience, we'll continue to try and work them into the conversation. And if we don't get them in the session, we'll try and get back to you uh, directly afterwards. Um, as we go into phase three here, uh, I am going to launch our last poll here. We have two more questions. Uh, this is touch upon what Eric, I think, was hoping to. Um, or maybe it didn't, maybe that one didn't get in. But anyway, I'll launch this poll and then I'll share the results. Um, so phase three is really looking at, okay, where are we a year from now? How have things changed? And, and once again, I think our goal for the session, we don't want to do too much hypothesizing about, you know, just random predictions about the future. But again, based off what we've seen in phase one and starting to see in phase two, you know, where, where, where does it look like we'll be in phase three or kind of where along that spectrum uh, do you see this all going? Um, and once again, I think there's a lot to think about and cover. Um, and I think a lot of these questions that we're getting in here right now kind of relate to, you know, what will this all look like? Uh, a year from now. So once again, I'll kind of hand it off. Does anyone want to raise their hand and, and, and start to address that? And if there you yeah, go. Yeah, I'm the, so I'm, I'm happy to. Yep. So, um, and, and, and I think amongst the three of us, uh, Open Path is probably the one company that has a, there's a, there's a capital expense up front, right? Hardware has to get deployed, gets, has to get installed. Uh, so there's CapEx plus there's OpEx uh, for access control, generally speaking. Um, what we see for, let's say, 2021 and beyond is, is certainly right now, landlords, tenants are going through a cycle of, is, is there 2020 capital improvement budget that we can deploy today by reprioritizing projects that we had planned for, but pivoting those dollars towards a COVID response? That and, you know, are there dollars available, emergency fund availability for COVID response that we can deploy? And... What does 2021 look like? Let's put together our technology roadmap. Some of the stuff that we're not going to get done this year because it's too big, right? It's too complex. And so they're putting it into next year. We see access control upgrades as certainly going to mobile, hands-free, touch-free. That's a, that's a no-brainer. There's a bunch of questions that we've seen on air quality. And so you start to see building systems start to factor in um, in terms of uh, air flow rates, uh, UV sanitation, uh, you start to see, you know, filtration standards increase. So I, I certainly see those big lift items and those might not even fit into 2021. Those might be 2022 type items. And then I also see a lot of elevator modernization because that seems to be where everybody goes to like, okay, I know how doors can open up in a frictionless manner, touch free. I know how I can get into suites. I got to get into this stainless steel box with a bunch of people and that makes me unner that makes me uncomfortable. And so what are the ways that we can efficiently move people, but give them the appropriate social distance space. So those are the types of things that we see kind of the bigger lifts. And then maybe the last part is how do you reconfigure physically reconfigure space, right? So as we went over the last handful of years from maybe a standard of 250 square feet per, per employee down to in some cases, hundred or less than hundred square feet per employee, how do you increase that? How do you get away from that open seating to more personal office space again, right? It's sort of like a return to the, uh, to what we've been in the past. Um, and that maybe Eric, it, it maybe that starts to address some real estate concerns of, I don't need as much space in those central business districts, those downtown urban areas, except for the fact that my space utilization has changed. My equation has changed and I actually need the same amount of space that I've been leasing, but only half as many people are going to go in. Yeah, well, I think uh, we're introducing and, and technology has enabled uh, the introduction of the time element, the fracking of the seat into many different time increments as opposed to one person occupying one seat. So, um, you know, I think, I think that will actually over time drive additional density, but density when it comes to dividing a seat by the amount of people that actually sit in it over, over time. Um, and I think that that's going to be interesting. In that poll, I thought it was really interesting that nobody agreed with me at all about the suburban campus. <laughs> they, they, they all said zero, even though I made a plug for that. Um, but the remote work and uh, workplace tech were the two, um, the, the two big ones. And I think 
that's probably because that you know everyone is thinking more in the shorter term and i think that suburban campus thing is more of a kind of a longer term shift um that will happen i think over time because of this yeah we i mean we've seen we've seen not this before but we've seen like this before right um where there's been some crisis some pandemic some event that causes people to say you know, we're not going back to work. We're not going to work in skyscrapers anymore. We're not going to work in cities anymore. We're not going to work in the suburbs, whatever it is, right? Um, but if you just look at, just look at basic data, right? Population continues to grow up. Workforce continues to grow, um, you know, and those two factors alone mean that you need more, you know, more space because not everybody is working from home, even if, you enable more flexible work, right? And, and you do some of that fracking, Eric, that you were talking about. You still need you still need the office space. And what we saw in the survey results earlier around collaboration and community and connection and amenities and uh, and engagement, like those are real things that that are meaningful to people and that that drive people to sit in. You know, nobody said they missed their their commutes. I saw zero percent on on that. I'm in that bucket too. Uh, but those are like those are the things that 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 and that people commute for, right? Well, um, yeah. And that's not that's not going away. Um, and and it shall pass. It's just a question of of when. It's going to be more and more about experience. I mean, I. I you know, in asking the question of my, myself as like, what is the purpose of the workplace? The, the thing that I, I keep thinking about is the college experience. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we could all do college online, right? But we don't want to do college online. We want to be in that experience, right? And I think what this will continue to do, because, again, technology has removed uh, a lot of the, the reasons we had to be at the workplace in the first place, it's now, what is the meaning? What is the purpose? Well, the purpose is going to be about the experience. And I think companies are going to be trying to replicate and extend that college experience into the workplace. I think they've been trying to do that, but now it's like the workplace is expi explicitly doing that. Yeah, I think, uh, I think you're spot on. And I, I, didn't anticipate that, but the survey results said that, right? Like that people want that real engagement, just like in, in the campus environment. Regarding the commute, I, you know, I actually would have been the camp that would have said, no way would I ever miss a commute. But then someone explained it to me and they were like, it's actually that break between home and work. Like it, 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 it's that, it's that um, transition, right? Because today we're all working from home, there's no transition. So you're never really sure if you're working or trying to do professional or personal life. Um, so I think, I think the commute has taken on a whole new meaning for me, um, during this time. Uh, I do want to get to one of the questions cause I, I think it addresses phase three, which Chuck earlier asked, you know, why invest anything? Like, why are we even talking about any of this? Let's just deal with it. I don't know if this is exactly what he's saying, but, uh, you know, once we have a vaccine, is this all going to go away? Like, will this all be irrelevant? Like, what does that look like in a year? Like, even if there is a vaccine, this is over. Will we still have an impact? Are these things we're doing now still be useful in the future? What do you guys think? Hundred percent, yes. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely, need to focus on improving the workplace experience, enabling a more tech, a more tech forward uh, workplace, using data to inform decisions. I mean, for landlords, having data that can inform capex and opex, that can inform leasing strategies, that can inform retention strategies and rent rent negotiations, uh, floor planning, space utilization is. Uh, is so powerful, uh, right? Like we've seen the, the horse has left the barn on technology and there are, and on data, and there are enough, there's enough critical mass in the market now of landlords who are differentiating with data and differentiating with experience and differentiating with technology um, that if, if the rest of the market doesn't come along, they're going to get they're going to get left behind because the workforce and Eric, you can probably talk about what you see with tenant companies, but like tenant companies are are demanding this. We heard from uh, we heard from Boston Properties about a, uh, a a lease negotiation that they were that they were involved in, where one of the one of the conditions of the lease 
uh, two conditions at least. One, that the building be, be enabled for 5G, and two, that they have a, an application for the, for the building to connect the employees to all of the amenities and, uh, and services that were in the building. So tenant companies are asking for, um, for that connection to the, to the building, to the city, and to the environment. Um, yeah. And landlords need to provide that. But Eric, I mean, do you, are you hearing that from tenants as well? I mean, I think it's, it, it's, it's a natural extension and the, and the, the tenant companies want it to be simple, right? Yeah. That's the interoperability. They want to be able to, 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 to have that differentiation. Um, um, the, the workspace for these corporations, this is their home, right? They want to make this the home of those employees. It's their brand. It's, it's that culture that they're trying to, um, to, to promote and create. And so leveraging, where everybody is, which is through native mobile is that's where, where everyone lives nowadays, right? Especially college students. Uh, you know, I have some not, before college students in my home and they're, you know, they're like, they can fix anything on my, uh, on my computer, or on my phone, you know, and they've only been at it a couple of years. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, I mean, this, this is definitely being, when you look at the 18 months it'll take, right? from where we started until sometime in 2021, it is the aha moment for prop tech where it's become mainstream to recognize the value proposition of investing in future proof or forward looking technologies and moving away from the limitation and, and exposing the limitations of legacy technology stuff that's been around, you know, since the nineties is just doesn't meet the needs of the, of the, the workforce, the workforce, the workplace today. So very, uh, very bullish on sort of how this will continue on. And, and don't forget, this is COVID-19, right? So just because we get a vaccine doesn't mean that we're, uh, we're protected against all future pathogens and, uh, and viruses. There's, there is a COVID-20 out there uh, and who knows what the impact will be. So you've got to make the investments to be ready for it this time. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. And, and Dave, I think you said this yesterday and sorry if I missed it, you said it again today, but like th there's, a new, there's a new category in the scorecard, right? And that category is cleanliness and or safety. And, and another, we got another question here. Uh, is there a benchmark? I, don't, I think the answer is no, but is there a benchmark that rates landlords against each other and how they handle COVID-19? And if there isn't right now, you know, should there be in the future and what does that look like? I don't, uh, I'm not aware of any benchmarks that are sort of ranking landlords or rating landlords uh, against how they've handled COVID specifically, but um, you know, we're building uh, with our, with the digital grid, we're building benchmarks about uh, those sort of three vectors that I mentioned before, the suite stack, the services stack, and the system stack for landlords, all overlaid with tenant satisfaction data. So ultimately landlords will be able to look and benchmark themselves by location, by class of building, by tenant mix, um, by amenity stack and, and so on and so forth. But we, we haven't delivered that yet. It's, um, it's being built in, uh, in, in real time now uh, for delivery later this year. Uh, other than that, I'm not aware of any, uh, of any benchmarks and certainly none that are COVID specific, but maybe I'll talk to the product team yeah. about that. <laughs> And uh, so oh, we have see. two minutes left here. Um, I got to do my last question. Um, you can kind of try and, uh, you know, I know we didn't get to all the questions on the side here. So if we didn't, I apologize. Um, last question is, what is, the, what is the legacy of COVID-19 when we look back on this time and say five, 10 years, what is this going to be an inflection point for? Uh, Dave, let's start with you. Uh, I mean, I, I think we've all been touching on it. It's, it's going to be the adoption of prop property technologies, right? The interoperable cloud-based technologies that uh, change the way prop buildings operate and change what that tenant experience or employee experience is like. Eric. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, further to that, it's more, it's not just the building, but it's the, it's the people and the connection between the people and the building itself that it's, it's not just a box that people are part of, but it's a entire system. And um, these systems are gonna become more and more integrated and interoperable as we talked about. And hopefully that leads to easy, things become more and more easy for, for people to feel comfortable, to be safe, to get things done, to be productive, 
to have that experience. Yeah, better, safer, more responsive. That all makes sense. And, and Mark, last but not least here, final thoughts. Uh, I agree with Dave and Eric. It's all about connection, connection between connection between people, connection between users and landlords, tenants and landlords, users in the building, the amenity stack, um, just creating that, those connections through interoperability and, um, and adoption. Awesome. I think our, our next webinar should be called interoperability uh, <laughs> off, off the theme here at the end. So um, we are uh, at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so I think we are going to wrap it up. Again, thank you, big thank you to all the panelists. I know you guys are super busy. I appreciate you joining us, putting the time in. And a big thank you to uh, everyone who joined today. I hope this is helpful and interesting. Again, I always like to emphasize, if you have other ideas on how to format these sessions, uh, we're all ears. We wanna get innovative and make sure that we can still continue to create compelling and interesting content that's helpful uh, to everybody out there. So again, a big thank you, everybody. Have a, have a great day, stay safe out there. And uh, thanks again. Thanks, thanks everyone. Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody.